patient is reviewed uh, after a tackling injury while playing rugby. Cannot explain uh, the exact mechanism, but was reviewed in a &E. At assessment, there is swelling at tenderness at the proximal interferential joint of the right ring finger, with swelling and slight rotation in the digit. The patient is not able to actively extend the PIP joint. There was brisk capillary fill of the digit and the skin was intact. An X-ray was done which shows a volar PIP joint dislocation without a fracture. While going before X-ray, a differential diagnosis of a PIP uh, dorsal joint dislocation, PIP volar joint dislocation, middle fillings fracture or a proximal fillings fracture or even a joint fracture dislocation can be differentials. The volar PIP dislocation is not a common injury. It's important to remember that a volar dislocation causes extensive mechanism injury. It is also important to understand the mechanism of the injury and the underlying structures involved to have a sensible treatment plan. It is also very important to differentiate two different types of dislocation. One that is a straight volar dislocation or a rotatory dislocation as a structure damage and the treatment are completely different. So there are two types of volar PIP dislocation, a straight volar dislocation and a rotationary dislocation. To fully understand the management of these dislocations, it is essential to understand the different nature of these injuries. A straight volar dislocation occurs when a volar directed force is on applied on the semiflex digit. The primary injury is to the central slip of the extension mechanism. These injuries are generally easily treated with close reduction and splintage in extension to allow central slip to heal. This is the same treatment as indicated for close acute botanier deformity. The distal interphalangeal joint should be left free to move. However, prior to applying the spring, it is important to remind that the joint is stable after the reduction. When the digit is anesthetized, the collateral ligaments of the PIB joint should be tested for stability with lateral stress applied in both full extension and three degree flexion. You can remember this as we similarly test for other collateral ligament in the thumb. With the digit anesthetized, the collateral ligaments of the PIP joint should be tested for stability with lateral stress applied in both full flexion and third degree flexion and full extension. The patient should also be asked to fully extend the PIP joint after reduction to access the extent of injury and injury to the central slip. In generally, uh, water dislocation are easier to reduce. When the central slip has completely ruptured, than one in which disruption is partial. Hence, there is a probably greater damage to the extension mechanism of the volar PIP dislocation that is easier to reduce than in one which is more difficult to reduce. Now, there is a controversy regarding whether the central slip should be repaired if it's completely ruptured or left and continue with the conservative management for a while. Spinner and Choi recommend repair of all disrupted extensor mechanisms, while Pimer et al. showed that it's better functional outcome if treated close. Anyhow, in the a &E, it is imperative to, after the reduction, to do a radiograph to confirm the joint congruity and it is well maintained. Now, volar rotary dislocation results from a volar directed force on a semiflex interferential joint with the concomitant varus or vulgus stress. It can be differentiated from a straight polar dislocation on just a radiograph. With this type of injury, there is a damage to one of the collateral ligaments, as well as varying degree of the volar plate and a central slip. The dislocation cannot be reduced with longitudinal traction as there is a noose effect. 
trapping the condyle in the tear between the central slip and the lateral band. The joint can usually be treated atraumatically if the PIP and MP joint are first placed in flexion before applying traction to allow the volar displaced lateral bands to relax. If the joint does not reduce with this maneuver, it is often a soft tissue interposition of a collateral ligament or a central slip. After the joint is reduced, a radiograph should be taken to confirm the joint congruity. Again, the integrative collateral ligament should be tested as previously. Uh, the patient should be asked to actively extend the digit with the finger still anesthetized. The patient generally have full active extension because the contralateral lateral bands and the portion of central slip remains intact. If the joint is stable after reduction and the PIP can be actively extended, the joint should be splinted for 7 to 10 days and then body tap to protect collateral ligaments. The patient should begin active range of motion activities. If the joint cannot be reduced and the congruity is not achieved after reduction, open reduction is necessary. In our case, the reduction was stable and the patient was managed conservatively. Anyhow, in a situation where the water dislocation requires surgical intervention, the joint surface is incongruence after reduction or there is a greater than third degree of extensor lack. The joint can be approached through a dorsal incision. The interposed extensor mechanism should be extricated out of the joint. This should be done under local anesthesia or wrist block and active extension tested to determine if, if extensor mechanism repair is necessary. Anyhow, if the PIP joint is unstable or the extensor tendon is repaired, the joint may need to be pinned in extension, otherwise extension splintage is adequate. Most polar rotatory dislocation can be reduced and treated close. Indications for operant inter intervention include inability to reduce the joint by close manipulation or incongruity of the joint after reduction. The joint should be approached through a mid-axial incision on the side of the collateral ligament that was damaged. Wrist block anesthesia is preferred so that the patient can participate in active evaluation of the extensor mechanism after reduction. If there is a soft tissue interposition, which is usually the lateral band, it will be removed from the joint. The joint is then reduced and the lateral band is repaired. Or if that is not possible, it should be excised. Because stiffness and not instability is the major problem, it is not necessary to repair the collateral ligaments if the joint congruity can be restored. Traditional recommendation for central slip repair would be immobilization for three weeks, followed by a protective range of motion exercise. It has been demonstrated that short arc, early active motion yields better results than immobilization for three weeks. For rotatory dislocation, where the extensor mechanism is not completely disrupted and open reduction is necessary, the recommendation is five to seven days of extension splintage to allow wound healing. This is followed by active range of motion and a dynamic extension splint to protect the extensor mechanism. Unlike dislocation, other joints such as shoulder joint the problem most frequently encountered in PIP joint dislocation is not associated with the fracture, is late stiffness and decreased range of motion and not continued instability. It is wise to advise the patient that it may take up to one year for the swelling and stiffness to resolve. If the patient has less than 60 degree arc range of motion after adequate rehabilitation, consideration should be given to PIP joint release. Another complication, as you can expect, is a chronic botanier deformity. Recognizing and treating the injury of, to the extensor mechanism can help avoid this. It is much easier to prevent the deformity than correct it secondarily, although this most often happens when the patient is not seen early by the hand surgeon and comes only after deformity has developed. The treatment is similar in the lines of late 
post-traumatic butchner deformity.